if I show up and do the job of a junior associate and I do the things that a junior associate could do, notwithstanding my credentials and my experience and my ability to do so much more than what a junior associate can do, if what I'm doing could be done by a junior associate, then the firm really ought not pay me more than it could pay a junior associate to do the same job. While Arjun was away, Team Arjun came to play. All the cats out of the bag now, folks, but we're still here bringing you our favorite and most importantly, actionable insights to Arjun's newest book, Profit First for Lawyers. We're going to help you accelerate your law firm's growth so that you can experience more profit in every aspect of your life. We're also going to be providing some behind-the-scenes footage of what it's really like to work with our John Robbins. So, put your BS aside for the next few minutes and put yourself, your family, your firm, and your profit first. Welcome back to another episode of the Profit First for Lawyers podcast. I'm your host, Carly, and today we are joined in studio by the very first, Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, very first how to manage employee that Arjun ever hired. Is that right? I think possibly as a W-2 employee, yes, but I know there were other uh, team members who were around before me who then later joined the team. So there may be some discrepancies on that, but I'll take it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But you were definitely one of the first. And Arjun tells a lot of stories about Stephanie and kind of you set the bar really high for everybody else. So I'm really excited to have you on today and talk about really what it means to cultivate kind of that culture of being a rock star employee and as well, all of your many stories of actually working with Arjun. So thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. I was, um, I'm was i honored. I'm not officially on Team Arjum anymore, um, but I'm always happy to be back and be part of everything and anything that makes the magic happen within Team Arjun and HDM. Oh, I love that. And so much of kind of the systems and processes and things that have been built out have your direct thumbprint on it. So let me, before we get into this any further, let's go ahead and have you introduce yourself to the audience. Who are you? What do you do? What did you do for Arjun? And then what are you doing these days? Yeah, my name is Stephanie Galvis. I am currently a third-year law student at the University of Florida and not even officially part of how to manage a small law firm or team Arjun anymore, but um, very much still how to manage a small law firm is where I grew up. That's what I say. Um, And Arjun and his wife, Allie, and our co-founder, both of them, they're like extended family to me. So, you know, I will always be available for anything the company might need. But at the time when I was working with How to Manage Small Firm, I wore many different hats. I originally was hired by Arjun in, I think, 2012. Um, and I was hired to be his executive assistant. And then I was also, I ran some of our events. I produced the, the content for live events. I also produced a lot of the written content, like the workbooks and collateral materials that our events have. I ran marketing campaigns from start to finish. I negotiated the hotel contracts from start to finish. I was also sending out the communication to our members, you know, to make sure that they remember to do to show up for the events and where to show up. Um, I've done a lot. It was it was a lot of fun working at how to manage, um, especially at the beginning when, you know, we were very much in the trenches and um, just getting started. It was a lot of days just me, Arjun and Alejandra in, you know, a office in Coconut Grove. So Stephanie, you mentioned, of course, that you are kind of pivoting from your business career into this law career, I have to ask, I've been curious for a while now, is that because of Arjun? Like, what what is your why there? Did you always want to be a lawyer? Yes and no at the same time. I mean, I never, ever thought I would be a lawyer uh, when I was 18 years old and started working for how to manage a small law firm. Um, I never thought I'd go to law school at 25 and leave a very good paying job at at a firm that gave me wonderful opportunities and really truly gave me the opportunity to have the sky's the limit um, working at How to Manage and with Arjun. So I never thought I would be here in law school. I can tell you I'm very happy um, and I hope to someday bring my legal career full circle back to working with small business owners and entrepreneurs on tax planning and corporate tax advising. Um, but you know, to an extent, yes, very much. Um, I met Arjun when I was 18, so he's had a lot of influence in my life. and. Um, more than that, given me a lot of opportunity to explore different things that I never thought were possible or that I just didn't know. Um, I am 
the child of immigrants. I am a first generation student, um, first in my family to go to college and definitely going to be first for a master's. I'm actually getting my master's and my JD at the same time. So I didn't know how to do things like apply to college. I didn't know what, you know, how to study for the SATs. I didn't know any of these things that I know that, you know, high schools help students like me, but it was just one of those things that I, you know, because I didn't know it seemed scary and overwhelming. And so I didn't put a lot of stock in it and I didn't make very big goals because I didn't really know where to start. So, you know, when I met Arjun and I was in college, I was in community college. Um, at the time, community college, or, you know, I don't know if it was a state thing or a federal program, but community college was free. And when I graduated high school, I was like, well, I don't really know what I'm going to do. Don't really, this whole paying for college thing seems like we can't afford it. So <laughs> I said, let me just go do the two years um, at the community college and then I'll transfer and do, finish my bachelor's at um, Florida International University. So that's what I did. And, you know, Arjun just gave me a lot of opportunity to see what is truly possible and see how big the world is. You know, there's a lot of times where I had a seat at tables that most 18 year olds wouldn't have. Um, and I'm sure people wondered, why does this girl get a seat at the table? And and while I was contributing, you know, I, I, while I definitely think I earned my spots, <laughs> I know that it was really because of Arjun. And I know that it was really because he gave me those opportunities as much as Ali did as well, um, our co-founder. But yeah, so while no, I didn't, I don't think I'm in law school because of Arjun, there's an element of it that did influence me. And then there's the other side of it, which is, you know, we have hundreds of law firm owners that are members of How to Manage a Small Law Firm. There's thousands that I got to work with over the years that I was at How to Manage a Small Law Firm. And so many of those firms do so much work that is so critical and pivotal and important for regular people's lives that I found was like, wow, I really want to be able to make a difference in people's lives the way that our members get to. Um, so that was an element for me, too, as far as why I wanted to go to law school. I just was saying that's so cool. And I, I had a little smile moment when you said like it, it you're you said something along the lines of my dreams were much smaller or or you didn't think you could dream big. And I was just thinking, man, there is definitely something about working with Arjun that makes you want to dream bigger. <laughs> At least for me, for for people on Team Arjun who I've spoken with. Right. It's like, gal, you, you get such a license to dream bigger. Yeah. Like, I mean, like I said, like as a first generation student and, you know, my family is from Colombia and, and you know, as much as my family has, it, we're, they're, they're great. It's not like I've ever wondered where my next meal was coming from, but I also didn't really ever think about what's truly possible. What does the 1% really mean? You know, I have never really thought about that. And, and that's something that Arjun really expanded my mind into. So when I decided to go to law school, for example, I was just like, oh, well, wherever I get in. But then I was like, no, what do I really want to do? And then, you know, I wanted to go to the University of Florida, go Gators. And uh, I wanted to go to UF and also do a master's in tax law. And so that's why I'm here now doing my joint program. And yeah, I mean, it was all about dreaming bigger and doing more. And 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 so was, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And so in a way, yes, it, I am sort of in law school because of how to manage a small law firm and Arjun um, and the work that all of our members do that really did ex inspire me to want to do more and to help people as well. Yeah, well, and this was your first official job anywhere, right? So working with Arjun was kind of your intro to office work in general. Uh, how do you think that that has impacted the jobs that you've had since then and your current pursuits? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was my, the only other jobs I had had before that were, you know, very retail type of jobs that I did in high school. Um, I've had internships since I started law school. Um, I actually had the opportunity to intern for one of our, there is no best member, but one of a, a very great member from how to manage a small law firm that I was able to intern for last summer in 2022. Um, that was after completing my first year of law school, I interned for that law firm. And this past summer, I interned for the Department of Justice. That was an incredible opportunity as well. And even when I'm in breaks from school, I still try and do, if I have the time, a project here and there. Our audience here is obviously primarily lawyers. So you guys all remember what law school was like. <laughs> Stephanie, you're a rock star. Thank you for spending your time. Never a bother. I'm always happy to be here. Well, now I know that you're kind of, you started with Arjun, you were what, 18 years old. I don't know how much experience you had had before you had gotten to that interview, how much research you had done. Did you have any preconceived notions about what it might be like to work with Arjun Robbins? No. And actually, I didn't even apply for a job with R. John Robbins. <laughs> so this was back in the days of Craigslist. Remember, we were talking about 2012 
where it was very normal. Your interview wait, hang on. The the position was posted on Craigslist? I know that the company used to post positions on Craigslist at one point. I don't know if the position that I went in for a job to interview for was posted on Craigslist. I'll tell the full story. Yeah, please. I went in for an interview with a buddy of our John's who ran a different business in Miami, uh, a small marketing firm, totally different industry. They were just friends. Um, I had applied to a job with his friend's firm. I went in for the interview, never heard back. Um, and turns out that Arjun and that friend were considering doing a joint partnership or a project together. So his friend was possibly, you know, he met me, liked me. He said, you know what, let's have this girl work at how to manage a small law firm because we know we're going to be spending more time there anyways. Um, so she may be somebody that maybe will grow with how to manage a small law firm better than the firm he had. Um, so he passed on my resume to Arjon and Arjon uh, reached out and interviewed me and then hired me on the spot. So when I got the call from Arjon, I was like, who is this Arjon? What is this name? <laughs> Where is it from? I remember my mom was like, I was 18. So I still live with my parents. And my mom was like, that's really strange. She's like, concerned I was getting kidnapped or something <laughs> going to an interview. Um, and then, you know, from this person that I'd never heard of or anything, um, so, you know, he just said, hey, my friend gave me your resume. He said, you were great. Can you come in for an interview? I said, sure. And yeah, so I didn't have any preconceived notions. I didn't know how to manage a small law firm was. I didn't know what the company did. I didn't know anything. I just went in. We It was like a match and it was and it still is, I guess, 11 years later. <laughs> yeah. You didn't even know that you were interviewing for our Johns. <laughs> no, I didn't. And funny enough, his friend uh, later on said, I never ended up filling that position. Do you have anybody that could work for me? And I said, sure, I have a brother who was also in college looking for office work at the time. And my brother also ended up working for that friend for like five years. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. I, you know, I have heard a lot about your story through Arjun, but not really uh, through your perspective. So this is very interesting. Okay, so you're 18. You are working in an office with Arjun and with his wife, Ali. You are the one executive assistant. How is it like working with Arjun? Can you talk a little bit about like the early days and then how is it like working with him today? The Arjun that I knew, I, I knew Arjun from in the trenches. I knew Arjun as we were growing. And, and there's a whole Arjun today that I haven't worked side by side with for the last two or three years. And I'm sure that's a different owner, boss, person, human, father, business owner, all the things that he is, right? Um, so the Arjun from 2012, when I first met him, it was so different. I mean, he, I could hear him on a sales call because at the time he was a salesperson for how to manage a small law firm. So he had sales conferences, like how to manage a small law firm.com forward slash appointment, where prospective new clients schedule an appointment to speak with our team and, and decide whether our services may help them grow their law firms in some cases, double or triple their law firms. That was Arjun doing those appointments. That was Arjun running through the same sales script that the sales team today uses. But except today, there's a whole team, there's a whole system, there's a whole funnel. Back then, it was Arjun on the sales call. And then as much as he had a sales call, he may jump into a meeting right after with a joint venture partner, um, trying to partner on a new deal for something that they, we might have been running, a marketing campaign or something. And then he may get off the phone and jump on a meeting with, you know, a Ritz Carlton for a venue that we're hosting a meeting with. So, so different, right, in 2012. I mean, today we have teams of people that do each of those functions. It was a very different experience. Um, we were very much small and scrappy and it was a lot of fun, but also I, I know that it was very stressful, <laughs> right? Um, there was a lot that still had to get done and um, the goals are not any less ambitious today than they were back then. So it was it was great. And then as as we continued to grow, um, it was it was all fun because I also left the company for one year while I finished undergrad and I went to work for Amazon headquarters in Seattle. So when I came back to the firm in 2018 after being gone for about a year and a half, two years, finishing undergrad and working for Amazon headquarters, that's what I feel was like phase two of how to manage a small law firm or an end of Arjun, um, because he was very much at that point, the CEO of how to manage a small law firm and out of production. You know, he was, he's always been the CEO. He's always been the co-founder and owner of how to manage a small law firm who wore, you know, but at one point he was wearing a lot of the hats and in 2018, once I returned, it was very clear it was getting him out of production so he could do those things that were the highest and best use of his time. So what I got to see at that point was a more disciplined Arjun um, who still had very ambitious goals and who was still very fun to work with. Um, uh, his mindset was different. It was all about scaling. And it was, it was very interesting and fun to watch because I got to see the company go from 
a different stage. You know, it was very much in the beginning, um, 2012, I think revenues were about, I think he had just broken seven figures. Whereas in 2018, I think we were approaching eight figures. So it was very different. Yeah, that's a lot of growth all at once in one time. Uh, and it's kind of cool that you got to be there for each of those. Um, I like that you called it the phases of our John. That's <laughs> it's like, here's phase one, here's phase two. Now, as far as like his interaction with you, how was he to work with on a personal level? Um, like, did you enjoy the work that you got to do with him? Did he coach you a lot? What was that like? Yes. Um, one thing is Arjan is a perpetual coach. So he sees the best in people. Um, and so he will always try to bring out the best in people. And he does do this by coaching. And, and I was very young and I've always been very coachable. I think I still am. Um, I think that's something that I hope I never lose as a character trait because um, I think it's very valuable for any person, any professional, um, and especially a young professional. Um, so he was very much coached me. Did I like working with him? I loved it. Not every single day, but it was, you know, there was definitely days where I had many projects and he walked in with a new one and I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get one more done? But it was, uh, it, it was, it, yeah, it was great to work with him. Um, he and I worked side by side a lot of times. Um, sometimes it was me running with a marketing campaign and getting his feedback on it or input on it. And other times it was me directly executing what his vision was. Um, there was a lot of there's a lot of times and projects where I really operated as an extension of him. Um, and at a very high level was, you know, if, if we were working with vendors or something, I was the point person to execute on something because I very much understood his vision and what he wanted. Yeah. And that's something he still talks about to this day. So I'm really excited to ask you this next question then, Stephanie, because you have so much history with him. And if you have more than one, then go for it. But my question is, what is the most profitable piece of advice that Arjun has ever given to you that you've been able to take in and implement? So one of the best pieces of advice that he ever gave me, and I mean, there's so many over 11 years, he's given me a lot to think about and and very much influenced who I am and, and my career path. But one of the best pieces of advice is, was probably when I was three or six months into working with him, um, he told me, I think I was annoying him or asking him too many questions. And I think maybe I was calling him with the third dumb question of the day. And, and then the next day he was like, you know, I know you're young and I know you're still learning, but I want to tell you that if every single time you pick up the phone to call me, it's a productive conversation or it's a conversation that makes money. I will always answer your call. And I really took that to heart. And, you know, it wasn't, I know it can sound maybe a little harsh or maybe a little presumptuous or something, especially when I was 18 years old. But I really took it to mean that he, what he wanted was to have me giving him more than what I was taking, uh, be doing more or contributing more or calling because I had, you know, a real relevant and productive uh, use of his time rather than something that I could figure out myself. And that's something that I've taken with me across everyone I've ever worked with into my internships in law school. When I have interactions with my professors at school, I always want to make sure that I'm contributing more than I'm taking, that I'm, if I'm asking for your time, it's going to be something positive, you know, and it's, and as a law student and as someone, you know, your first year in law school, you don't feel like you're very adequate or good at anything, right? So it's kind of hard to do that. But, you know, so then I want to make sure I show up to um, professor's office hours with thoughtful questions and thoughtful insights and things that are going to make my professor say, oh, you know, that was not a total dud question that I, you know, this person could have Googled at least. So it's it's really about showing that a level of initiative that I think a lot of people don't always demonstrate. I really like that, Stephanie. That's beautiful. And it's, a, it's kind of a reframe that I have never thought about before. God, I feel like I said that a lot on this uh, particular podcast, but I love how mind expanding kind of the the advice that people have gotten from Arjun ends up being for me, right? And and kind of transformative in their own life. Uh, that's such a cool reframe. So like if you pick up the phone, if you're going to ask for somebody's time, make sure that what you're going to ask them or what you're going to tell them is valuable. You know, I think it can be a concept that can be applied in other ways. You can enrich other people's lives um, through a conversation, through a thought, you know, especially uh, at least I'll relate it back to law school. I mean, everyone's an academic <laughs> in my law school. Everyone's uh, likes to think about provocative thought questions, or at least most people do, um, especially most professors. So, you know, I'm going to make sure I show up with a question that's going to at the very least say, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Or, oh, I can see why you're confused. You know, let me let me reframe this this way, not just something that's 
at a very baseline level, not interesting, you know? So I think it's looking for the ways in which you can enrich someone else's life, even if it's something that you don't feel like you can contribute a ton to. Yeah, God, that's such a respectful way to think about communicating with others, really in any capacity too. I, my my former executive, um, whom I absolutely love and adore, he used to say all the time that the only the only resource that you can't make more of is time. So that's a really cool cool reframing of the thought that we should use our time with intention. Um, and really respectful to think I'm going to use my time and ask for your time with more intention. That's beautiful, Stephanie. I love that. Thank you for bringing that today. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to consider. And I mean, he was especially he is still, I know, so busy that it's it's really important. I think for anybody listening today, you know, we're busy and other people in our lives are busy. And so if you're thoughtful of other people's time and then when you ask for someone's time, you're very mindful of what you're asking them for and what you're giving them, I think they will appreciate it and be more willing to give you their time. So over the summer at my internship, I, you know, as a second year law student, again, you don't necessarily feel like you're contributing a ton all the time, but I was very thoughtful about, you know, when I went into an attorney's office to ask questions, I made sure I brought the right questions. I, I wasn't just walking in blind. I made sure I was doing research already and I could have a productive conversation with the attorney about whatever issue I may have been assigned um, and often what ended up happening was I'd get assigned additional projects, um, every single time I'd end up, which was, I mean, double-edged sword. I had more work, sure. But, um, what ended up happening in, is in some of the feedback I got at the end of my summer internship was, you know, a lot of the attorneys really liked working with you and it's because, and they all gave you repeat projects because they thought it was just productive to work with you. You, you were thoughtful about the questions you asked, you, um, were able to relate the issues well, and, and you really were, you know being mindful of, of how you were using your time. Ah, uh, yeah. I, yeah, thank you, Stephanie. That was amazing. I, I like that too, that it has led to additional success because people respect when you respect their time and when you respect your own time. Um, that was really, really amazing. Thank you for bringing that today. And I will say, you know, uh, we had some discussion about clips that you might choose today. And I think the one that you finally landed on um, has a, a little bit more to say on the subject of respecting our own time, right? Do you want to go ahead and introduce that? Yeah. So that clip was on normalized salary, where Arjun discusses basically that even if you are the owner and attorney for your law firm, right? If you're doing the job of the receptionist, at that moment in time, you are only worth what the receptionist is worth. And if you are still billing your time as the attorney picking up the phone when a prospective client calls, well, that's not actually what your normalized salary is. Your normalized salary has to account for the times that you're actually doing other types of work, lower and less value work. Okay, well, I can't wait to see this. So let's roll the clip. Ideally, the law firm should only be paying you what it would cost the firm to pay anyone else other than you to do the same job or jobs that you do in your role as an employee of the law firm. So the idea is if I show up and do the job of a junior associate and I do the things that a junior associate could do, notwithstanding my credentials and my experience and my ability to do so much more than what a junior associate can do. If what I'm doing could be done by a junior associate, then the firm really ought not pay me more than it could pay a junior associate to do the same job. Think about if you were an investor in my business and you saw me doing the job of a junior associate and you saw three other junior associates doing the job of junior associates. And each of them is getting paid a hundred thousand dollars a year, because let's just say that's the market value of a junior associate in this market. But for some reason, the firm's paying me $200,000 to do the job of a junior associate. You as an investor would say, no, that's not okay. Fire yourself as the junior associate, hire a fourth person, to be the junior associate, pay them the same $100,000 market rate to be a junior associate and pass the rest of it on to everyone as profits. That's really what a normalized salary is. Hmm. 
Yeah. So that kind of really resonated with me because of what we were talking about earlier, right? Um, when I rejoined How to Manage a Small Law Firm in 2018, and I mentioned Arjun was very intentional about getting out of production and out of the roles in the firm that were not the highest and best use of his time. It was for precisely that reason, right? There was there were people out there who we could either hire or were already working for how to manage a small law firm that could do the, the jobs that he was doing at a lower rate. And that would not only be more cost effective for the company, but also more efficient and profitable for Arjun to go out and do other things that were more profitable for him and for the company altogether. And not to mention, there was also just a sanity cost that for him, you know, there came a point where doing sales calls was not necessarily what he wanted to be doing. He wanted to be doing other things, you know, whether it was a speaking engagement or a VIP day or masterminds. I mean, he likes doing, you know, a lot of different things. So it it, it really reminded me of, um, you know, what, what we went through in, in building how to manage a small law firm. And then it also reminded me of tying it back to that piece of advice that, you know, he gave me about um, always being intentional with your time and with what you're doing and what you're asking people, because, you know, they're also trying to operate at the highest and best use of their time. Yeah. You know, and that it makes me think of one other thing, Stephanie, um, because we were talking a little bit about, you know, th some of the best advice that Arjun gave you, which I in my mind, my interpretation kind of boiled down to respecting your time and respecting other people's time. And I remember this day in the studio when we were, you know, reading this particular chapter in the audio for the audiobook. And um, one of the things that Arjun mentioned to me was that this concept of the normalized salary, what you have two things. Number one is you have to pay yourself at the same rate as the job that you are currently doing. And number two is that so many uh, law firm owners don't pay themselves for doing the job of the janitor or the job of the um, secretary or the job of whomever, right? That Sometimes they'll do, they'll do those things for free, and then it becomes this major heavy lift when you have to hire somebody to fulfill that role because you're not used to paying somebody to fulfill that role because you've been giving your labor for free. And so there's there's kind of a, a two parter I see on this, and I think that your point is so very valid and and great. And the second part is really respecting your time, making sure that you're getting paid for the efforts that you're doing, and also that you're not creating a situation where it will be really hard to replace you as the person who does, you know, the things that aren't necessarily the highest and best use of your time, um, because you've been doing it for free for so many years. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think there was, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I think there is an element of that for myself as well. When I was employed for How to Manage uh, way back when, uh, I'm talking about the early years when I was like 2012 to 2016 or seven, 2016. Um, I was getting paid a low rate, what you'd expect a college kid to be making, like $15 an hour. And, and there was a lot of jobs that I held and a lot of hats that I wore and things that I did, some well, some not as well, some as good as the market value for someone else that would have been doing it. Um, I say professionally because, you know, someone that was really trained in that field versus me who just got up to speed with things and and would roll with the punches at how to manage. And so I was able to execute on things. Um, and so there was times when, you know, I was doing things for how to manage. I was doing jobs. For, for example, I used to run a lot of our events. Um, I didn't run all of them very well, but I was running them. And today our events team, I'm sure it makes a lot more than $15 an hour as they should, because they do incredible heroic work. And um, there was probably an element of that, you know, when once we started hiring for those jobs and who would be doing those prof those jobs professionally, not at the standard of, well, what were we getting by with? Because this was our starter phase. This was when we were just, you know, testing things out. There was an element of, there was an element of what is that job actually going to cost us? What is, what is it actually going to cost to have a professional events manager on our team that's going to um, execute events from start to finish without any snafus versus, you know, college year old me just trying to figure it out. Oh, golly, I love it. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. You know, I, I will say, listening to the way that Arjun speaks about you and the way that you speak about the company, I think it really does say a lot of very good things about your character. And I think it goes back to kind of what you were touching on earlier, right, is that one of your superpowers is being coachable. And that it's really cool to see what kind of success that that 
attribute. Even when you didn't have a ton of experience at, at 18 years old, the ability to be coachable has kind of led you in this really incredible career path at, at such a young age. And I think that is really, honestly, inspiring. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Yeah, thank you. I'll say, since you were speaking, one of the other pieces of advice that Arjun one time gave me, if anyone's listening to this and um, they're younger professional, I hope you also take this into account. But one thing Arjun said to me once was, you're young enough to make mistakes that people will forgive you for and people will give you second chances and people will like, he was basically saying, you can get away with making mistakes because you're young. He said, there will come a day when the mistakes won't be forgiven as easily and you will not, you'll, you will be expected to not make mistakes. Um, so to take advantage of the fact that I was young and um, make mistakes is essentially what he was saying. I mean, not grave mistakes that you can't fix. So one time I deleted the company's entire calendar. So <laughs> that one was bad. <laughs> but like those were one of, I, and I actually think that piece of advice came from that day that I deleted the company's entire calendar. I think it's, you know, two things. I think, yes, being young helps, um, but also I think being culturable helps and not making the same mistake twice helps. Um, so when you're working with people and peers and they know that you don't r regularly make mistakes and you definitely don't make the same mistake twice. Um, people in general are more forgiving when you do do make a mistake. So there's two really great pieces of advice that Arjun has given me. And for those of you listening who maybe are, you know, just getting your career started, um, I hope you also make mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, I love that. That's one of my uh, one of the things that my dad tells me. All the time, uh, you know, my background's in performance and my parents used to be professional singers. And one thing that my dad always coached me about um, when I was young was if you're going to make a mistake, make sure everybody hears it. And really what he meant by that, and I don't know if Arjun meant the same thing, I just thought it was an interesting uh, way to frame that, right, was um, it's better to take risks and to go for it. And if you do that, you're less likely to make mistakes. But if you do and you really went for it, then make sure that everybody hears it, basically, right? Like, <laughs> right, you can't be afraid to make mistakes and you're less likely to make mistakes if you're just going to have 10 seconds of courage, as Zoe would like to say, and just go for it. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's a version of what he was getting at. I was very fortunate that, you know, I got to work with someone like Arjun who gave me a lot of grace when I inevitably made mistakes. So um, that's another that you just reminded me of. I love it. Thank you so much for this today, Stephanie. Like this has really been very enlightening for me. I'm so glad that you let me take you away from your crazy busy schedule of studies right now. And I definitely, if you're okay with it, I will absolutely ask you to come back another time in the future. Yes, I'd love to. Thank you for having me. All right, folks. Well, that's what we've got for you today. Stay tuned next time as we go over the very last of the seven main parts of every successful law firm. I am so so excited for you guys to hear the culmination of this big story and have our last little section of Tea Time with Carly, at least as it relates to Chapter 5. Thank you so much for listening today. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Profit First for Lawyers. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, tell a friend and buy your copy of the book at ProfitFirstForLawyers.com. Your future self will thank you for it. And we will see you next time.